Fritz, thank you so much for being willing to be our first person today. And you have um, so much to share with us in a short period. We'll just we'll start right away, if that's OK. Right. <clears throat> you were a young boy when Hitler came to power in Germany. Let's start with you telling us about your family and you during those years living under the Nazis as their power grew. And as part of that, tell us what it meant to be Geltung's Judah or counted as a Jew. What did that mean for you and your family? A Geltungsjude had one non-Jewish and one Jewish parent and was raised Jewish. He was subject to all regulations and had to wear the star. The whole he escaped deportation, the Nazis couldn't make up their mind. And the far away he lived from Berlin, the more likely he was to uh, escape deportation because there he was subject to the whims of a local commander. Mm -hmm. uh, before Hitler, we had a very nice life. My father was a judge. He had the Iron Cross and always uh, had the flag, even taught me how to salute the flag. And he, had, he won the Iron Cross in the First Iron World War? Iron Cross in the First War. And I guess he uh, considered himself a German. Mm -hmm. And, but we had a very good life, lived in Maine, went to the zoo, watched the big gorilla who, when he got an apple, carefully looked, and there was one blemish, he didn't eat it. <laughs> well, uh, my mother was Lutheran, and uh, we still, and we uh, celebrated both Jewish and Christian holidays. I got the best of two worlds, Hanukkah and Christmas, <laughs> Passover and Easter. <laughs> <laughs> but there came the day when Hitler came to power, my father was dismissed. The day he was dismissed, he told him not to leave the court, the front door, because of the the demonstration of uh, brown shirts. My father said, I came in by the front door and I'll be leaving by the front door. Of course, he lost his job. Money was quite a problem. We had to move immediately. And, uh, but oh, my good aunt, Alfredo, really helped us very much, stood by us all the time. And my mother's relatives also stood by us. However, my father's colleagues, at least most of them, they came, some with actually flowers. I was so sorry, we can't have any contact with you. And these had been his colleagues on the court? Yeah, colleagues, other, other judges. Yeah, other judges. So sorry. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, one or two maybe, but most of them simply couldn't or didn't want to, I would say. Fritz, you, you were there, of course, uh, during the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. What did it mean for you? Yes. Well, uh, 35, 36 signs showed up at the restaurants. Jews are not welcome. Out in suburbs, uh, what is a uh, go back to Palestine signs. And there was quite a bit of special uh, benches. The mer it's a, 36 uh, Olympics, the signs disappeared. Of course, the moment they were after the Olympics, they came up again. They didn't want to see people from other countries what was going on. On a, on a, on a bit of a lighter note, as, as hard as those things were, you were still a boy and you had a mischievous spirit and you were telling me about <laughs> pranks you would play on tourists. <laughs> A friend of mine was sitting on the bus, double decker. We were sitting there, and I gave a tour. And I started out giving misinformation. Now, you see here, that is a president's home. And over there, that is the opera. All nonsense. And all the people <laughs> wondered what he is doing. During, during that time, Fritz, did, did your father make efforts to try to emigrate from Germany to get out of Germany? Yes, of course. Right. But of course, in order to immigrate, first to have a quota, then you have to have money, and then you were able to get passage. 
it wasn't so easy. And so just all That's the right. doors no, were closed. You couldn't yeah. just uh, pack your suitcases and leave, no. Mm -hmm. The quota was called, and then, uh, the, in fact, you only got a visa if you had passage. It was quite difficult. So your, your family's living under these circumstances, as you said, conditions are very hard, food is scarce, your, your father's lost his job. Yes. Then comes Kristallnacht, or the yes. Night of Broken Glass, November 9th through 10th, yes. 1938. You're just 11 years old. Tell us about Kristallnacht. Well, I went to school as usually, and there was a broken shop window. Oh, it could have happened. Another one. The third one, I realized something was going on. And then I passed by a synagogue, and I know the flames and smoke came out. By the way, how did she know what windows to break? And that's not generally known. They didn't have lists, no. About a couple of months before, each Jewish shopkeeper had to place his name in tall white letters on the shop window. All they had to do, looking for those big white letters, and could break it. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went to school. Some of our teachers were sent to the concentration camp, and I knew I got a notice for home. Because of special circumstances, poor report cards will be late. Tell, the, tell our audience what Kristallnacht was. What, 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 that was something that wasn't just in your community? No, it's all over. What had happened uh, in Paris, a misguided young man shot or killed uh, a, a consul or a German member of the embassy. And of course, in retaliation, they, they claimed the uh, outbreak of violence in people. Actually, the people didn't. This was done well organized by well organized groups. Not and it was all over Germany? All over Austria. Germany. In fact, Berlin was, in small cities, was even worse. Mm -hmm. In Berlin, of course, uh, it was not quite as bad. People thought of many foreigners, maybe we ought to do it. But the little town was horrible. And, and on that night, hundreds of synagogues were burned throughout well, Germany. Many, did, uh, did you many know? were sent to the concentration camp. My father fortunately escaped uh, the state. Did, did you realize at the time that it was across the country? Had a pretty good idea. Had a pretty good they idea. Had a good okay. idea. You said to me that that was November of 1938. Right. You said that the start of the war in September 1939, when Germany right. invaded Poland, that's when things really changed for, yes. for, for Jews and for your family yes. in particular. Well, of course, first I had to take the name. Jews had to take the name of Israel and Sarah. I was Fritz Israel Duckstein. Then in 41 came the star. But above all, at the time, we had to deliver jewelry, radios, bicycles, furs, and uh, rations. We did not were allowed to buy meat or white bread, and had no special allotments. We were allowed only to shop between four and five in the afternoon, and uh, we not even allowed to have a haircut. And and you know, it was only some of the uh, restrictions. Or <coughs> and when you shop between four and five, the odds were good there was nothing left in the store. Yes. My mother could go, but if nobody was around, the yeah. shopkeeper was decent, then wait a minute, i give you something. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, Among all those restrictions that, that took place, and you mentioned a couple of them, besides radios and things right. like that, Jews were forbidden from having pets. Yes, among other things, that's right. Well, and, and talk about your, if you don't mind sharing, about your pet. Well, we took care of a, a pet of uh, friends who were deported, and we had trained him. If you gave the boy a piece of uh, food and said, for the Jew, he ate it. 
right if he said, well, the Nazis, he did not. <laughs> <laughs> when did you first start having to wear the star? This was at that time. About that time. 41. And one of the things you shared with me is that police would come by with pencils. Oh, yes. It has to be fastened with so and so it was a nasty police line that came with a pencil. And if you get the pencil behind, oh, it's pretty bad. When, when did deportations begin? In 41. In 41. 1941. Okay. It start first. It started slowly, and it went more and more afterwards. Including many of your classmates yes. and friends? Did, did you, when, when, you, when you had a neighbor or a classmate or a colleague who was deported, did you have any idea where they were being sent? No. 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 Well, first we said, well, uh, maybe it's much that had some idea. You never really knew. In the beginning, actually, uh, it was only quite orderly people big uh, notice you will be deported. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they got a list. They had to uh, list their belongings and furniture. And at a certain time came an officer, usually actually a policeman, a uh, plainclothes man, and uh, they had to go closed, sealed the apartment, and they had to go to the closest, the nearest uh, corrections uh, place. From there, they were transported. At, during that time, where were you living? Were you we, st were you still in your own home? A small apartment. So you've been yes. forced into a small apartment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The um, the Allies started bombing Berlin yes. about that time too. What can you? What was that like for you? There you're facing we all the threats of the Nazis down there and hoped that uh, you wouldn't be uh, hit. At that time, I'm still going to school. And uh, if uh, the attack lasted beyond one o'clock, school started two hours late. If it, it lasted past one o'clock in the morning? Yeah, yeah. 35 okay. minutes. And there we were sitting, hoping it would stop soon. On the other hand, maybe a little bit longer, and school will be shorter. Sound like a typical kid. <laughs> yeah. At that time, yes. And, and at that time, we, did, uh, we still uh, had to go to school. School closed in uh, 1942. And, and being a kid, besides hoping that bombing would delay school, you also yeah. had a hobby of collecting shrapnel. What? Collecting shrapnel? Yes, we shrapnel. We uh, collected shrapnels and uh, exchanged them with bigger shrapnel boys. And as you, as you began to tell us, you, you were able to continue school until June 1942. Yes. Then the schools closed. After that, you had several very close calls yourself of deportation. Yes. Tell us about those and the events that followed. And also tell us about the closing of the school for you. Well, we closed the schools and we were given a, um, a final uh, report card reason because of the ordered closing of the Jewish schools. And I guess most of my classmates were deported. A few, one or two came back, one or two went in hiding, and a few were guilty soon and survived. But I would say the end were about 35 or 40 the old parish, and so did the teachers, most of them. I was struck um, in your book, you write eloquently about your teachers and your fellow students as everyday heroes. Yes. Yeah. Particular is his teachers. They came, taught us, helped us to forget the misery of every day, gave us something to, we could build on later on. They came. They knew they were deported, but true to their profession, they came. We didn't realize it. We didn't appreciate it. Now I know what they did. Now I really can thank them. I, I was really struck by what you wrote yeah. about that. 
you had a you had a very frightening experience when your mother helped someone who was facing yes. deportation. My mother helped someone and carry suitcases to the correction point. And was and that S man, what are you doing with those Jews? I bet you have a Jewish S man. Tomorrow, have your son and husband deport downtown to a correction center. Downtown was a special correction center. It was used to be an old people's home. There we were, about at the time, about 10 men in a, f in a room. And other they also had non Jewish wives. We were not permitted to lie down because the commandant, Arius, uh, he came from a very nasty SS. He had for, uh, forbidden to lie down during the day. We did it anyway. However, the policeman who guarded the building, whenever he left the office, came running around, get up, get up, he's coming. Remarkable. Had they been caught, they would have wound up at the uh, Russian front. And is this when you encountered the notorious uh, Brunner? Yes, 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 he especially came from um, Vienna. Well, after two or three days, suddenly I was told, you will be in the commandant's office for interrogation. Well, my father and an old gentleman, a journalist, prepared me that don't be a hero. Don't show any sign of contempt or hostility. Answer the question fully. But do not, do not volunteer anything. Well, I went to the office. He was sitting there behind his desk. At the side, about 10 uniformed SS watched the proceeding. He tried to catch me, really. Huh? Your mother is Jewish. No, I said, my mother is Aryan. And uh, I asked some questions. Ah, I was working at the, uh, at the office of the Jewish uh, uh, community. Well, I tell you. They give you a decent job. Tomorrow, report to the uh, labor exchange and go. And out, outside, I found my father, and he stepped out with a sigh of relief. The date, January 24th, 1943, my 16th birthday. This was the first. That was the first. Tell us about the next one. The second one. And we went to work at a factory. And one morning, a good friend of mine we was sitting at the workbench doing some work for, I don't know what, anyhow, for the Air Force. Suddenly, door opens and the SS officer comes in. Ah, attention, get yourself outside. Outside, we assembled, and then he asked the driver to come in. The truck came, we were brought to the truck, and then at the back to guard an SS, we were driven downtown. There we were uh, out at uh, what had been a dance hall crew. All the uh, tables and uh, chairs had removed, and we camped in the little, in the middle. Uh, it was quite for some of the women. It was quite. It was Saturday, half a day. Many of the children were not in, in child care, maybe at home. It was quite. Uh, very bad for them. And that we were sitting there, it was amazing. No complaints. We were all sitting there. And after war, or 12 hours, we were called, my good friend Gert, we were called uh, and we were questioned by a very nice plain clothes man. And he said, I tell, I tell you, get out of here. Don't want you to see here again. And we stepped out about 8 o'clock at night. And by stepping out at 8 o'clock at night, we broke the law. Because the curfew for Jews was 8 o'clock during the winter, 10 o'clock at night. And we broke the law, but we walked home. And uh, I mean, my mother was uh, on a trip visiting her aunt, and I immediately sent a telegram. It would be advisable if you came home fast. 
next morning, it was time to get uh, ration cards, and I went to the ration card office, and lo and behold, it was a big moving van. Everyone who came on the moving van, and we were transported to a collection point in the synagogue, where I had become a mitzvah when it was uh, three years ago. And so we sat some time, and then again were transported downtown to a building of the Jewish congregation, it's so-called Rosenstrasse, Rosen Street. And there we were other men who had uh, on Jewish wife were quartered in a room just enough to lie down. And, and we spent our time um, deliberating what what happened to us and standing in line for the restroom. Of course, the facilities were set for hundreds of men suddenly coming in. After a week or so, and food, well, I remember we got once at four o'clock, we got some turnips to eat, this I remember. And, and I, after a week or so, I was called out and my uh, <coughs> release slip was typed by a, Secretary of the Jewish congregation, and uh, they met my father too. And we both were ready to leave. And then so we had to present our uh, release slip to the uh, sergeant, Sergeant Snyder. And he looked at my father and said, A judge you have been, that you certainly have ruined the lives of many people. First said my father, I hope not. And we left. But what he did not know, while we were inside, there was a demonstration where the mothers and wives, they demonstrated, they demanded the release of the children and husbands. And they stayed there. And they fight first the regular police, then the SS and Gestapo. It was the only challenge to authority in the Third Reich. And as one can see from Goebbels, Minister of Education and Folk Enlightenment, from his birth, his diary, he said, oh no, let's not have it now. We can take care of the mixed marriages and the Jewry and the Keltung soon later on, not now. He didn't want any unrest, certainly right after the debacle of Stalingrad. And so after that, I was sent to a labor gang. We went for side to side cleaning up after air raids. Before, the before we move on to that, um, just so we all hear that, it was the only demonstration The only demonstration the third in the Third Reich against authority. They did not go. They came actually with a machine gun. They didn't go. And there's, a, there's even been a movie made about that. Yes, there's a movie made about that. Yeah. And now there's a moving uh, memorial memory of the people who, who stood up for their loved one. Yes. So now you're forced, uh, you, both you and your father, are now forced to be part of these work details. Yes. And so you started to tell us, what were you forced to do? Well, we had to clean up to tearing down um, um, ruins. We moved around and clean up streets. And actually, too, it's notable. I uh, had an accident. A wall, part of a wall fell on me, knocked me out, and I was injured. We had, uh, we was a medical, he fixed me up temporarily, and he brought me to a hospital, to a Catholic hospital. They were not permitted. Non-Jewish hospital were not permitted to help Jews, but they did it anyway. Sewed me up, gave me a better result. Not worthy. They took a risk on my behalf. They could have gotten in real trouble, but they took a risk. I'll never forget that. I was um, struck, uh, you, you shared with me that as you're out there doing these work details where you're forced to clean up rubble, really hard work out there. Yes, the, we had, the, actually, back and forth. Actually, of course, I've only, there were about four other young former classmates and the older men were lawyers. Uh, chemists, uh, uh, any 
engineers. But, uh, and uh, of course, we, when these young people don't learn anything, and it started a kind of school. For instance, my case, when I remember I had a wheelbarrow when it was being filled, I was given a question, uh, went, which I had to answer when I came back. And I still remember one. When you come back with an empty wheelbarrow, you will name the Great Lakes of the United States. And of course, something else. Imagine 16, 15 years, we were quite innocent. Of course, first the older men had to explain to us some of the uh, language that was being used. Came very help, was very helpful. Later on, when I was in Minnesota and I worked in a in fact, uh, the factory, and some nice people really try to uh, teach me four letter works, words, <laughs> and they tried very much to use. Didn't work because those words came of Anglo Saxon origin and are very similar in German, and it did not work. <laughs> you knew that. <them. laughs> you, um, at one point, doing these, these forced labor work details, you were told that you were going to now have to do it. You had a catastrophic mission. To yes. Do. Well, we were bombed out twice and lived temporarily in the Jewish hospital. The morning, one morning, I set out for my regular job. And I stepped out of the building. Suddenly, some uh, SS came. Uh, on the truck there, you're hereby uh, uh, <laughs> detached to a so called Catastrophe mission. Catastrophe mission. Well, after having all right the truck, open up is where we were in the front of the Devil's Den. Devil's Den after Eichmann's headquarters. Arthur Eichmann was the driving force behind the deportation. Any you you know who Arthur Eichmann was. Well, I actually was fairly lucky. My work there, uh, one of the young lieutenant who said I want him, he's strong and yeah, I was assigned to him. I was lucky, very decent, not anti-Semitic, really. Some of my other uh, fellows uh, had a very rough supervisor, nasty, uh, to tell you. And uh, the deputy uh, commander, the Colonel Gunter running, running around with a dog and cursing us and tried to sneak up on uh, the little break. Well, I was lucky again. He, he might move one of the furniture, one of, of uh, Captain uh, Stus Stuska, very nasty, notorious. He was barely civil, but at least uh, he didn't assault me. Well, one day, we were uh, standing around, uh, and I guess removing some rubbish. Suddenly, Eichmann is coming. Oh, boy. I wonder, I, I wonder, I really wondered how he would look like. Well, there he was, disappointed, ordinary. Nobody would have noticed him in the crowd. Came right, stood right next to me, gave some instruction and left again. This, this absolute monster. That absolutely. Yeah. I stood shoulder on shoulder with that monster. But lucky. Yeah. From during that time, uh, middle to the end of the war, you're in Berlin. As you've described it to me, Berlin was bombed all the time, right. frequently. Food was scarce. Conditions were more and more difficult. How did you and your parents manage to survive and exist under those conditions, what was it like for you then? Well, you adapt. No, didn't lose hope. I didn't adapt. We did things, I tell you, it was amazing. You, uh, food was scarce. I remember a case we brought was a loaf of bread. No one, the mice had gotten into it. Well, what did we do? We just cut off one part and then continued eating. And uh, of course, you didn't change clothes very, very often. No hot water, no soap. You just uh, adapted. And of course, 
good spirit, you always told little stories, some jokes that helped us. Okay. For, Please. For instance, jokes are better on. Goebbels, right minister of education and welfare, fell in the river spray, runs from Berlin. Young man pulled him out. My poor friend, you saved my life. What can I do for you? He said, I want a state funeral. He said, funeral, yes. My father finds out I pulled you out of the river. He's going to kill me. <laughs> or, <clears throat> as Esmond said to a Jew, I am going to shoot you unless you tell me which one of my eyes is glass. Oh, he said to you, it's very easy. It's the right one. How do you know? Oh, it looks so human. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, of course, you know, we had a uh, substitute. What a uh, horrible mix with oil. Everything in the bread was horrible. Sometimes, I guess, I don't know what they put in there. Everything substitute. My father said, when will the war be over? Well, when the British eat rats, and the German eat rat substitute. <laughs> <laughs> this little story help us. As, as, the, um, as the German defense of Berlin was collapsing, uh, you said to me that you and your friends figured it would take 31 minutes for the Russian tanks to get through the barriers that had been put up. Yeah. yeah. But happened one day, it was in, in fall 41, 40, 44. We were detached to, to a place not to tear down, but to build foundations for a new Berlin after the war. At that time, imagine 40. But then we were detached again to the southern part of Berlin to build tank traps. And there we are sitting, uh, building tank traps, digging ditches, and putting uh, metal girders at 40 degree angles. So all night, I guess, once in the middle of the night, uh, they gave us some soup. But next morning, they told us, OK, we can go. Well, we looked at our handiwork and thought, now, how long? Will it take the Russians to get through? 31 minutes. The Russian tanks will come to our tank traps, will laugh for 30 minutes, will take them one minute to get through. <laughs> this actually what happened. Uh, two armies approached Berlin. From the east, Marshal Zhukov, the south, the Marshal Konyev. Marshal Konyev came from the south, and of course, he got in Berlin very fast, so this southern and uh, western part of Berlin, they couldn't, they couldn't get to the Jews. There wasn't too much fighting anyhow. I believe we helped a little bit. We didn't do a very good job with our job. Mm -hmm. But actually, I would say probably uh, Conti have helped us. Yeah, in fact, you'd said that. You survived because of your mother, yeah. luck, and Marshal Konyev. Yes, he came in. But he shook off the east, eastern part of Berlin was hot. You, um, I want to go back to a point you were making a few moments ago, um, Fritz, and you, there as the Third Reich is literally collapsing, yeah. you were assigned to build the foundations for the the exactly. New Berlin. Exactly. Foundations for a new Berlin after the war. Mm -hmm. it, it, at what point did you believe or know that you really were safe? Well, when the war was over, well, we were working close to an SS uh, uh, what do you call it? Where they keep people. A barrack? Bar an S barracks. Lo and behold, what did we see? A group of heavy trucks being pushed by the SS men. Well, we knew if the SS, if they don't, if the SS doesn't have any gasoline, 
when the demise of the Third Reich can be fall off. That we realize pretty much over. I never forget. We had, you know, Schadenfreude, delighted at their misfortune. I never forget it, even though I can feel it to see it. Fritz, um, I've read several accounts of the Russian assault on Berlin and then about life in that devastated city in the months following the war. So you feel safe, the threat from the Nazis is over, but now you're occupied by the Soviets in an in a absolutely devastated city. What, what was life like for you immediately after the war? Well, I, actually, food uh, at the beginning, it was pretty bad, but actually after a while, the, when the Russians came in, you know, we were lucky. We had some food. In our place we lived, we had to move many times, a last apartment with two other couples. And downstairs was a horse butcher. And the Russian brought their wounded horses to the butcher. And we could eat, we had some horse meat. Actually what, actually, what happened at the time, the Jews still had meat. They could go to the horse and got double. And one of our relatives reported she fed meat to the family. And they never knew what, what are you feeding? Yes. Oh, the butcher is very, very nice and gave us double. Horse meat, but if you have nothing else, you eat it. How did the Russians treat you? First, I remember I was away trying food and came home, and there the Russians already were at the uh, apartment. And, but of course, they didn't believe me, uh, Nazi uh, or Jews. But one of our uh, one of the people in our apartment spoke some Russian, they explained, showed the uh, star, and they believed that that, that wasn't uh, SS man. But you had to convince them that you I were I had Jewish. to convince yeah. them, yes. Yeah. They thought, oh, young man, what he's doing here? Did, did you or others that survived, did you consider taking revenge on the Germans? No. We saw it, yes, for a moment, but we wouldn't lower ourselves to You shared with me, and you wrote about it too, that the no. winter of 1945 to 1946 was an exceptionally tough winter. What were conditions like then? It was, at, that, at that time, already uh, <coughs> three powers, four powers occupied Berlin the Russians, the Americans, the British, and the French. And then, you know, if the, if the uh, changed in administration. If the Russian administered black bread, the Americans white bread. We know exactly who was in charge. It was a horrible winter. And imagine water pipes froze. Toilet couldn't be used. Can't you imagine that we lived in a, people lived in a, a suburb. You could uh, bury uh, uh, <coughs> You had uh, burying ground. You could do burying. Mm -hmm. But what did you do if you didn't have? Well, what you could see, perhaps was really delicate, you could see quite well-dressed people with little packages which they deposited in parks and in front uh, lawns. As long as it was freezing, it was OK. But you can imagine what happened after it thawed. But this was war. When, when was your father able to begin to resume his work and his life after the war? Well, after the war, actually, after the war, I was able to go back to school, and my father went, uh, was reinstated. At the time he lost count uh, towards uh, his uh, salary and uh, um, 
old age. But he, he was reinstated as a yeah, judge and, and got credit for his time. Reinstated. So, so you would, as, as, as Berlin was being rebuilt and, and beginning to come back, and of course it was divided up between control of the Soviets, the French, the British, and yes. the Americans, by 1948, you managed to come to the United I States. I decided yeah. to go with my father. People, my parents let me go with Harvey Hart. My father said, if I were younger, 10 years younger, I'll come with you. But there I can't. It's completely different law. American law based on old English law, German law, and old German law. I couldn't do uh, with, uh, yeah, carry on my profession. But you go. But he said, I hope you'll choose a profession that's not limited to one country. And so I did. Yeah, you could be a veterinary. A veterinarian. Veterinarian anywhere, right? right? That was sound advice from your dad. Correct, there. yeah. Did, but your father and your mother stayed in, 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 in Berlin. Berlin. Did many other Jews stay in Berlin? Some went into Berlin. I would say, uh, actually, the younger always all left. The older people stayed because it was all the people were difficult to start a new life, mm -hmm. a new language. But young people left, I would say, yes. I was struck by, you wrote in your book that um, after, after the war, you're going back to school, you were, you were in a class, and in your classroom, there were kids who, like you, young men who hadn't had an education, and returning German soldiers yes. in the same classroom. Right. Well, we started after school. After three years without school, went to school, special courses order to make up, and we, we studied for the final examination of the two you went. There were German and Jews, and some of the German uh, young men had to have, <coughs> had to leave early and finish school. At the, at the beginning, it was quite cool, but then we realized they were not all Nazis. And they realized Jews are not actually different from any other people. And they got along quite well. So what was it like to come to the United States for you? You came over on a ship. What was it like for you? Uh, and you were how old, 21? I was, I was 21 on the boat. On the boat. It was the 30th of January, 1948. I remember standing there on the ship, <coughs> troop ship, was stopping waiting for clearance, <coughs> I looked out and saw, it was night, I looked in the street, cars moving, and I wonder, I, I, I changed between expectation and apprehension. Mm -hmm. I knew, I looked forward, and I knew that some people had great difficulties. But, <coughs> but then, of course, the, the, the organization joined the Joint Commission sent us to a hotel, and there we had to wait until we sent to a city where the Jewish uh, uh, congregation had agreed to take care of some uh, new newcomers. And I was called in an office and said, well, you can go either to Detroit or St. Paul, said the capital of Minneapolis. I had studied quite a bit, but uh, United States, and uh, I chose to go to uh, St. Paul. I knew it would be very cold in Minnesota, but I did not have heard, didn't heard yet, have a, didn't have heard yet, it described as having only two seasons, July and winter. <laughs> it was quite that bad, but very cold in Minnesota, I assure you. You, um, Tell, tell us the um, tell us what your name means. Means good luck stone. Gluck is good luck stone. Is stein is stone. Yeah, you, you talked about that in your yeah. book. That good luck stone. Actually, I had to decide now. Shall I change my name? Yeah. Should I call it S. Paul Gladstone? No. <laughs> Once on the first name, shall I keep Fritz? Well, in St. Paul. I went through the phone, and there were many Fritzes, actually. Minneapolis was uh, 
bin ich äh, Skandinavien, in Germany, lived in St. Paul. And I kept uh, the name. You, um, as we mentioned in the beginning, you're an opera fan. Oh, yes. Where, where did that start? Tell us how that started. Uh, um, it, uh, the Jews were not permitted to have radios, but I had a little crystal set, which without electricity it was wonderful. I listened every night yeah. and to my announcement whether you could expect uh, an air raid. And I said, it's no. Oh, and he said, tomorrow night they're going to broadcast an opera, Tosca. I'm going to listen a bit. If I'm lucky, there will be no air raid. Okay, I put night, put on my ear, phones, and listened. And I was completely entranced by the music. It was the opera, Tosca, was sung in German. The diction was excellent, and I could follow the action. And not too, not uh, half an hour. I listened for two hours until Tosca heard, had heard herself for the, the uh, mom, uh, waltz of San Angelo. And from there, I become a real opera, I, I tell you. Fritz, what is, it, what is it meant to you to write your book, your memoir? What, is, what has that meant to you? Well, I think people, it might be interesting to see what happened. And uh, and actually, well, more or less, uh, to tell that was it. I came over here and could uh, could make it. I would say, might more or less uh, gratitude that, in spite of all, it wasn't easy. But yes, at school, studying, uh, I had many jobs, uh, elevator operator, bus boy, uh, selling, uh, um, putting uh, picture, uh, faces or earmuffs, and uh, helping uh, PhD candidates in their German examination. And I ran into trouble, didn't charge enough, and I really was called to order for uh, undermining the going rate. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I was able to make it. Yes, you were, in, in a stellar way. Yeah. Um, one last question, and then I think we'll turn to our audience for a couple of questions. In, in, in light of the fact that you had homes bombed out and you lost so much, how were you able to manage to have those photographs we saw earlier? Yes, well, of course, we bombed out twice, and all the photographs were lost. But of course, my good aunt, whenever there was a picture, she got it too. And of course, she more or less gave the picture or reproduced them, and we have gave them back to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are pictures. That's the only reason you have those. That's photos the only here. reason. But other was that no pictures, nothing left, bumped out twice. Absolutely. Well, let's turn to our audience for a, a few questions. Um, we have microphones in each aisle. We ask that you wait till you get a microphone if you have a question. Try to make your question as brief as you can. I'll repeat it just to make sure that we understand it correctly, and then Fritz will respond to it. So do we have uh, anybody we have right here in the front I row? May. OK. Why don't we, uh, we can hear you, but the back of the room may not. So we got to put a mic in your hand. OK. Here's Emily, okay. After you came to America, were you able to communicate with your father and your mother, or today, even your extended family that's still in Germany? The question yes, is, for the back of the room, the question is, yes. Oh, okay, Fritz has got it, okay. <laughs> At that time, I have a new telephone. You wrote airmail letters. Was the system disrupted after the war? Could you communicate freely with your parents right after the war? Yeah. yeah. And, and your father eventually came to the United States, well, right? But I was uh, right here. I was stationed in the Army at Fort Dietrich, uh, and my parents visited me when I was here. OK, do we have another question? We have one over here. When did it become apparent to you and your family and your neighbors the magnitude 
of what was about to happen. When, when did it become apparent to you and your family and others around you the magnitude of what was actually taking place with the Holocaust and what did take place? Well, of course, we knew something was going on, but actually we never knew exactly what happened. We, at the beginning, we still could send some food to people in, uh, in Polish cities, fine, and got a card back, thank you, and after a while, no card back. And of course, we had an idea, but didn't know for sure. How quickly, when the war ended, did you actually know what had happened? Well, some people came back, and uh, some of the survivors uh, told us what happened. And of course, uh, it was publicized, of course, by the uh, occupying forces what had happened. It was made clear, look what happened. Thank you. Do we have another question? All right. Well, I think um, after we finish uh, today, Fritz is going to go upstairs and he's going to um, sign copies of his book. He'll be available to sign it. So that will also be an opportunity for you to ask Fritz another question if you have one or, or just say hi to him. So Fritz, thank you for being our first person. I want to be, hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> We, it's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. Yeah. So I'm going to turn back to Fritz for the last word. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. Remind you we'll have programs each Wednesday and Thursday until August 10th. Uh, the museum's website will have information about first person in 2018. So we hope that if you have the opportunity, you'll come back and join us. And one more thing before Fritz gets up on the stage, and that is that our photographer, Lolita, is going to come up on the stage, take a photo of Fritz with you as the background. So if you'll stay with us for that, that'd be great. And then we're going to try to get Fritz up, up as quickly as we can so he can go and sign copies of his book. So Fritz, it's yours. It was my good fortune to have come to the United States. And I'm forever grateful for the help I received and the opportunity given to me. I well, you my American citizenship most highly. And I'm often asked what I have learned from my experience. And my answer is always the same. Don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. And then do it now. Pay that visit. Make that call. Write that letter. If you have a dream, go after it now. And if you have two bottles of wine, drink the better one first. Yeah. <laughs>